So I made it. It's good. In plenty of time. We are here together. It wasn't even stressful. It was, it was nice. It's easy. It's good. Jamie didn't have to play another song. I mean, that would have been good. It would have been good, but... Um, we're going we're gonna to read from, from Psalm chapter 27 uh, this morning. Apologies to the Lairds and others who were in Prince Rupert when I spoke a similar message. But, uh, <laughs> and if you were at the Reformed Church this morning and rushed over, then <laughs> just go back. <laughs> Psalm chapter 27. Verses 0 to 14. You don't always get a verse 0, but here we go. Of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it's my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Don't turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Don't reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Don't turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So I want to start just by asking this question of us. What is, what is security? What does it mean to be secure? Does it mean I've got savings in the bank so that if anything goes sour, I've got enough money to cover it? Or does it mean I've got insurance for my house so if it floods, for instance, um, I'm covered there? Or maybe I've got uh, a pension going so when I retire, I'm going to get regular income. Uh, those are things we can do, right? Those are things we can do to, to help our, our finances be more secure and stable. Uh, but in the end, do they really equate to security well of course on the one for for one for one thing there's a whole lot of other places in life besides finances that we want to be secure in and and for another thing uh, no matter how much we invest into this idea of, of financial security something could always take us by surprise something could always push us aside in financial calamity and we we just don't have the power um, the knowledge and the power to secure our, our finances totally. And I think the same is true in other areas of our life. Uh, uh, physical safety. Can I secure my own and my family's physical safety? Well, sure, I can do things. I can try to live a healthy lifestyle. But um, end of the day, things can just blindside us, come in from left field, uh, and, and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, we lack the knowledge and the power uh, to to provide security for our own lives. What about relationally? Can I, can I make sure my relationships stay secure and they don't get shattered? Well, I can do things. I can do things to, to help myself have healthy relationships. But end of the day, no, I can't secure them. I can't make sure that they're secure and nothing shatters them. What about internally at least? Can I, can I at least secure for myself this, this internal, unshakable view of the world that, so that nothing coming from the outside is going to shake me? Well, even there, we fall short. Things come. The world around us shapes us. We get swayed or we get totally blown. So what is security? What does it even mean to be secure? 
Notice that all those paths to security I mentioned uh, have to do with my own control of things in my life. I will save and invest in such a way as to secure a financial future for me and my family. I will keep myself and my family safe. I will hold these relationships together. I will figure out some internal framework that can't be shaken. But the problem is, as I said a few times, we just don't have that knowledge or that power to do that. So we don't have that kind of control over our lives. So the psalm I just read uh, points us to a different path to security. So instead of control, it puts trust, trust or faith. And, and, and David, uh, who wrote this psalm, uh, he experiences, I think, both of these uh, paths to security, or supposed paths to security. If you look at David's life, you know, he, he starts as this humble shepherd boy, and, um, and he testifies to King Saul later that, you know, whenever there was a beast that came to get my sheep, uh, God would provide, and I, I would be able to, to defeat the beast. And so he says this just as he's about to go face Goliath, and so then he goes and faces Goliath and, and, and trusts in God again. And sure enough, God provides uh, deliverance and security uh, for the whole nation through his hands. And then he gets famous. Everyone's like, yeah, David. Uh, but it's, it's, it's good fame, but it's not necessarily the kind of fame that makes you sit in the lap of luxury because, of course, the king is trying to kill David. And so he's on the run. He's in the woods. He's got this motley crew around him. Uh, and he needs, again, to really trust in God for security. And there's these stories that come out of that time of God uh, providing security for him for delivering him when he's in these really tight spots. And then eventually David is recognized as king. And uh, he becomes king over Judah and then king over the whole nation of Israel. He's victorious over his enemies around. And there's this feeling of security. And it seems like that's uh, when, when David kind of goes the wrong way. Uh, he's sitting, sitting in his palace and Joab's out with the armies uh, in a war, and he sees this lady bathing, and, uh, and he commits adultery with her. And then he tries to take control, right? He tries to, to use his own control to provide security for himself, and so, and so he brings her husband back and, and tries to get them to sleep together. It doesn't work. So then he sends her husband back onto the front line and gets him right in the line of fire, killed. And it still doesn't work. He still gets found out. Total disaster. Disaster, disaster. And then... Uh, Pretty soon, his own son uh, becomes, or, or, or kind of claims the throne, and, and David runs away. So again, though, he has to, to learn this first kind of security, where he trusts in God. And he's on the run, he's in the, in the wilderness, trusting in God to provide. And again, he sees God provide, and sees God as his, his security. And then he comes back, he regains the throne, uh, all is seemingly well, and then it seems like the same thing happens again. He starts trusting in his own security and tries to take control. And he tries to take this, this census uh, of his army. And, and Joab's like, no, don't do that. And, uh, and, and he does, though. He's like, okay, i got to see what I've got, see what i got to, to make, uh, make my nation secure. And, uh, and God uh, disciplines him for that. And then, honestly, David's life kind of ends on an ambiguous note. He, like, makes sure Solomon gets the throne. And then he kind of tells Solomon to kill all his enemies. <laughs> and so it's kind of a weird note. But through his life, I think we see these two sides. This profound trust in God for security, and on the other side, this trust in his own control to, to bring security to himself and to his nation. And so this psalm uh, teaches us about this other way, this, this way of trust, and how that uh, brings us into security. So we're going to look at this idea of trust or faith. Um, I'll probably use the two basically interchangeably this morning. And, and so we're going to break the psalm up into four different sections to help us do that. And I'm not going to um, read uh, these sections again as I go through. So I'd encourage you just to open your Bible just so you can skim as I'm, I'm, as I'm going. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the verses as, as I come to each section. So this, the psalm starts with this uh, statement of confidence in God's ability to protect David. And then there's kind of these two sections that kind of make up the body and, and they're kind of similar. The first uh, in the first one, David just wants to be in the presence of God, just wants to be close to God. And then in the second, uh, David, David is pleading with God, asking God uh, to deliver him 
And then the final section uh, of the psalm is just David. He restates his confidence, and then he gives this short uh, exhortation, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So those are the four bits we're going to go through. So the first one, this is verses 1 to 3, if you want to look. Faith has an even though confidence. The first thing I think we see about faith here. Faith has this even though confidence. David says, you know, he has no reason to be afraid. He has no reason to fear, even if wicked people come to try to devour him. Even if there is an army camped against him. Even if his enemies are waging war against him. And these, are, these aren't just kind of hypotheticals. This is David speaking. He's, he's experienced all of these things. But he says, even in those situations, he has no reason to be afraid. So why? Why can he say that? He can say that um, because, the, because of the first words in the psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. I think he's pointing to this like superiority of God as a place of security. It's like, God himself is my light. It's not going to get dark. God himself is my deliverance. I'm not going to be defeated. God himself is my fortress. I'll have refuge in him. When David points uh, to God as these things, it's like, how could anything else, no matter how awful it seems, uh, be a cause of fear to me? How could I ever be afraid? We started by talking about the inadequacy of ourselves to provide security for our lives. And I think in contrast, David's showing here this more than adequacy of God to bring security to our lives. If we truly believe that God will be our fortress, why would we ever fear anything? It can lead to this really profound, deep confidence. Even if an army comes after me, which has never happened to me, actually. But David, it happened to David, and he said, even if an army comes after me, it's got nothing on God. It's a different kind of security, though, isn't it? David isn't controlling his life and avoiding all the nasty situations. He's not ensuring that everything he wants for his life happens and that nothing that he doesn't want happens. He doesn't have the control. But he says, in the midst of those bad things, I'll trust someone uh, who knows even better than I do. That's what, that's what trust is. That's what faith is. It's difficult because we have to release our control and say, this is what needs to happen and say, no, I don't know what will happen, but God, I trust you. Uh, I believe in you. You know what's best, better than I do. And you can take care of me in the best ways possible. So the security we find in trust isn't based on our own understanding and ability, but on God's. So that's the first aspect of faith uh, we see in this, in, this, in this psalm. Faith involves confidence in God's pro- ability to provide security for us, even when things look bad around us. Okay, second section, which is verses 4 and 6, six or 4 to 6, 4, 5, 6, um, is this idea that faith wants to be close to God. Faith wants to be near to God. So we're, we're reading this psalm. David's like, the Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I be afraid? Of, of whom shall I be afraid? And he keeps going. And then all of a sudden, he starts talking about wanting to be, wanting to live in the temple, wanting to be in the tent of God. And it's kind of like, okay, where, how does this connect? Where did that come from? But we see how it connects in verse 5, which says this. Where is it? There it is. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. So this idea of, yeah, as I draw close to God, uh, that's where the safety is. Now, I don't think David is just using God. He's not just like, yeah, God's, God's safety for me, so if I come near to him, then I'm going to be secure, so that's why I do. There, there's, this, there's this really beautiful picture, actually, of David saying, you know, I just want li- to be close to you. I just, all I want to do is just gaze at your beauty all the time. So there's this uh, love of God uh, that comes from David, uh, just, just in who God is. But David also acknowledges that as he draws close to God, that's when he finds this place of security. And I think that's an important point because it says that David's not just playing around. He's not using God's name in vain. He's not just saying, 
Yeah, I have so much confidence. God's on my side. He's got me covered. Rah, rah, rah. I'm good. No, he, he's not just using God's name. He's, he's acknowledging, actually, no, in order to find that security, I actually need to draw near to God at all times because it's in him where this true security dwells. It's the Lord who is security, not anything peripheral to him. So David knows that it's only as he draws near to God that he comes into a place where there's true security. And that's, and that's David's pursuit. He wants to be in the presence of God. He wants to be close to him, to be aligned with him, and then to find security in him. So faith involves confidence in God, even when things look bad, and it also involves drawing near to God at all times, wanting to be close to him, to be with him. And then thirdly, uh, faith pleads with God. Uh, faith pleads with God. And I think that can seem almost like it doesn't fit for us, uh, maybe, because we're like, David has this confidence. This is how he starts his psalm. And then just a few verses later, all of a sudden, he seems like he's losing his confidence. It seems like maybe he's getting desperate. He's saying, God, don't forsake me. God, come to my help. You've helped me before. Come help me. So is he? Is he, is he getting desperate? Is he losing his confidence? I don't, think, I don't think so. I think it's just that faith involves both of these things. It involves this confidence of who God is, and that he is the greatest security. And part of what faith means is bringing the difficult things to him. Faith isn't stoicism. I can do it all. It's not static. It has confidence, but it also pleads. I've witnessed this this movement in my life um, that that kind of almost equates faith with denial. Uh, I, I think I've said this before, but I have uh, an intestinal disease called Crohn's disease. I've had it since I was in early high school. And I've gotten a lot of prayer for healing, uh, which, which I believe in. Uh, I love prayer for healing. But, but sometimes through the years, um, I've gotten prayer for healing, and, I've, and I've, I've begun to say, yeah, I have Crohn's disease. And I'm met with this response, no, you don't. Uh, or don't speak that. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Um, it's, it's like faith can't tolerate any negative admission. That's not faith. It's, it's something different. It's something that makes God actually really weak and, and makes us the ones who have to kind of guard him. And I think we can do that in other ways too. I don't think it's just uh, for physical healing. I think we can act like our faith is something that we have to use to protect God. And the result is that we end up trying to take control again. And we end up making God smaller than we are. We don't protect God. God protects us. Faith looks like us coming humbly and in need to God with whatever comes to us. Faith doesn't have a problem admitting the negative. It recognizes it as something very real that needs to be brought to the God of security, to the God who is refuge. Faith says this in verse 9, Don't hide your face from me. Don't turn your anger away, or don't turn your servant away in anger. You've been my helper. Don't reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. There's a a, a statement of confidence again, even even in the midst of it. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Don't turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. God is the one who is responsible for our security. Not the other way around. So faith brings needs and troubles to God and pleads with him for deliverance and for refuge. Final uh, thing that faith is from this psalm uh, is that faith uh, hopes or faith waits. This is how David finishes his psalm. He restates, uh, again, after this pleading, he restates that, that he, is, he was confident in the midst of his trouble And that he believed that he would see the goodness of God in the land of his living. And that's his lifeline in the midst of trouble. And then uh, he, it appears that he actually speaks to his own soul. He speaks to himself and gives himself a bit of a pep talk. And he encourages himself to wait for the Lord. The trust in God that David expressed in the beginning of the psalm has led David uh, to seek him to want, to desire to be near him, to plead with him. And then finally, uh, 
he, it leads him to this stance of waiting. Of waiting. And the, the Hebrew word kava, or here it's kave, is, is about, it's like hopeful waiting. It's like looking down the road in anticipation. Something's coming. It's not just like waiting. Yeah. Waiting, God, what are you going to do? I, I still have confidence. I'm going to see God's uh, goodness in the land of the living. So I'm waiting, anticipating it. And then De- David's exhortation is bolstered by this, this encouragement to be strong and to take heart. And I love it because I think it, it tells us that, hey, uh, faith, this, this faith that waits in the midst of trouble actually takes courage. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's encouraging to just even hear that, I think. We might not see the goodness of God in the land of the living right away. We might experience circumstances that make us feel unstable. But our encouragement is to draw near to God, to seek his face, to pray for his deliverance, and then to wait courageously, take heart and wait, in the confidence that he is, in fact, the truest refuge and the most solid security, and that we'll see his goodness in the land of the living. It's difficult sometimes, right? I, um, we've had this, this amazing story in the community. I was just over at the, the CRC this morning uh, where uh, Pastor Joel is a pastor, and, and he's, he's given his kidney to this guy, Chad, and um, it's been successful, and we've all been praying and, and hoping and, and rejoicing in this. Yes, we're seeing God's goodness in the land of the living. This is amazing. Same time uh, for, for myself, I have a, a good friend. He's a, he's, a, he's a dad of one of my one of my best friends in, down the Lower Mainland, and and um, it's been a journey for a while. He he has uh, pancreatic cancer. He was diagnosed in the fall, and uh, at first it was like, hey, uh, this is this is good. It hasn't spread. It's contained. Uh, I think I think it's good. We caught it early, and then it was actually it's it's inoperable. We can't operate. Devastation. Then they're like, actually, you know, or they talk to different doctors and they say, hey, let's just try this treatment of chemo. And, um, and so they do this chemo for months and, um, and it shrinks. They say, hey, we can operate now, actually. Amazing, amazing news. Um, and then they say, okay, but actually it looks like the, the, the soonest date is in August. Oh, man, so you just have to do chemo just to kind of maintain it. And then this week, uh, I get an email, hey, the day is tomorrow. We got an operation day tomorrow. Wow, amazing. And then, and then the, next, the next evening, another email that says, hey, we really weren't expecting this. Everything looked good, but the cancer spread. It's in the stomach and it's fatty tissue or whatever. How do you do with that? Courage, heart. Courage, heart. Wait for the Lord. The land of the living. Right? Faith is confident in God's capacity to be a secure fortress. So it desires to be close to Him, it seeks Him, pleads with Him in times of trouble, and then it waits in hope and anticipation. We don't know how it looks, but we trust that we'll see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Why don't we pray together? Ask the band, worship team to come back up. Lord, um, sometimes we see you moving so clearly. Sometimes we don't. pray you'd um, just remind us, encourage our hearts uh, with the reminder this morning that you are a more solid security, refuge, deliverance, light for us than anything that we could provide or control. God, I pray that you'd stir us to response, to draw near to you, God, to your place of refuge. God, to, to bring the trouble to you, to be honest with you and bring the difficulties into you, the place of refuge, and that you would encourage our hearts, uh, that we would be enabled by your Spirit to take heart and wait for you 
and trust that this land we're living in uh, will see your goodness. In your name, Jesus. Amen.